but you know, hope, hope, hopefully they'll figure out figure out a little better uh, uh, interface for um, for that purpose. I'm sure they will. Um, I don't see uh, our landscape changing you know, too much uh, anytime soon. So I think uh, even those people who have been slow to adapt will eventually adapt um, in these platforms. I think Zoom having been the most highly used one coming out of uh, coming out the gate, I think where they were forced to. Uh, <laughs> actually catch up and bring themselves up to speed given the the zoom bombs um and a lot of just different you know faulty things that were happening with you know um large conglomerates and you know that they, they don't necessarily care for those type of hiccups <laughs> so that means the software provider has to come in and you know get on, get on top of that very 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 rather fast and quick um, yeah definitely um, let me see, let me get this off. Um, and we'll be starting in a few. Thank you again to everybody who has already filed in. We appreciate you for coming out. We're just giving people a few extra minutes um, to go ahead and log in so that we can have a, a nice body for our presenters um, who are going to be sharing some very, you know, helpful, important information with us this evening. Okay, and so with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Devon Lassine. I am the Community Engagement Specialist from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Um, just to give you a quick uh, brief idea of what it, what it is we do over at the Commission on Arts and Humanities. Um, our mission is to provide grant funds, programs, and educational activities that encourage diverse artistic expressions, um, as well as learning opportunities. So all at the District of Columbia, residents and visitors can experience, you know, rich culture of our city, and that ranges from uh, grants as it pertains to, you know, helping people with the infrastructure of their business, all the way to building out murals um, and some of which you'll hear tonight in terms of helping uh, some of our residents navigate um, 
the DC landscape as it pertains to creatives um, individually as well as artists organizations. Um, I also have here with me with here with me and sorry if I um, messed this one up. Congress Heights Community Training and Development Corporation here with us this evening, who will be presenting um a lot of the content that will speak to the needs of artists um and i also have my colleague here patrick uh Reliza, who is our who's going to be helping us with tech to this evening um and i want to thank you and appreciate you for that um because that's very important moving forward as we just discussed um and so with out going too much into that what i would like for everybody who has already joined us on the call to do is i will unmute everybody um and then i will just call out uh your name as i see it appear on the screen and to help um the presenters this evening if you could so kindly just give um who you are and what discipline within the arts um are you in and if you are a individual artist or a arts organization or represent an arts organization um so with that being said i will unmute all and um, and can we start with our denise Hi, my name is Arnie. I am with the Sustainable Community Project. It is run by Lisa. We are in partnership with. Can you hear me? Slightly not. Okay, so is there a call in number? I can call in on my phone. Contact me later. Is there a call in number? Okay, so so what we can do for so what we can do for you while you uh, go ahead and do that if you feel more comfortable just dropping it into the chat and I can uh, read it off um, for you if um, just to be aware of time and um, if you don't necessarily have the access I'll do that for you um, and with that being said um, can we have Rachel Curry up next. Hello, testing. Is this all good? Give me a thumbs up. Yes, thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, I am just here to observe and uh, just a lover of the arts and patron of the arts and amateur artist myself, I guess. So excited to be here. Thank you for uh, this program. Okay. And what are you amateur? What are you amateur in before you? Uh... Um, I like painting, um, mostly acrylic, uh, also have a background in music, so. Okay, shout out to the visual artists. I'm here for you. Um, and so our Denise has responded. Um, she is with the Sustainable Communities Project um, and she is an architect and a watercolor painter here to support the commission. We thank you very much. We appreciate that. And shout out again to the visual artists in the room. And with that being said, I am going to ask Y Jones to go up next. Good evening, everybody. I'm not gonna show my screen because I'm in the kitchen cooking. It's okay. Um, I am a small business owner, district art and crafts. We're a multimedia home-based studio and we do ceramic art and uh, nature crafts and batiks, and I'm just here to learn more. I've been to a couple of the professional development series workshops in the past when they were in person, and I got a lot out of it, and I'm hoping to get a lot out of today. Thank you, thank you. We appreciate you all. Um, and so before I pass this over to, um, let me first, okay. And before I pass this over to actual our actual presenters this evening, I just want to give a courtesy heads up and let everybody know that this Zoom call is being recorded um, after this, so that for all of those who could not participate with us here tonight, um, we can share out this information that may be helpful to anybody doing these um, 
hard trying times um, to help them navigate these spaces. So with that being said, I'm no longer going to hold up the great Quan to go ahead and start um, his presentation. And again, he'll uh, he can tell you all about himself and all of the great work that they do in the community. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Wendell Kwan, and I'm with Congress Heights Community Training and Development Corporation. Basically, we are a community development uh, corporation that provides both workforce development, uh, adult education, and also small business technical assistance. In the, we're east of the river uh, in Congress Heights uh, in Ward 8. Uh, and we manage uh, what is called the Main Streets Program, which we support uh, the businesses in Congress Heights. And we also uh, run a program called Great Streets, which is a program that provides small business technical assistance uh, to businesses throughout Ward 8 and 7. Uh, and then we uh, do a program that's, which is called a facade program, which helps uh, small business owners do improvements to the exterior uh, of their business. The other thing is that the Great Streets program uh, through uh, another city agency, DEMPED, provides uh, grants up to $50,000 uh, to businesses uh, to do interior and exterior uh, improvements to their businesses. And so we in the past uh, have uh, done creative economy uh, boot camps uh, because there are a lot of creatives in DC and particularly uh, east of the river uh, to guide them to uh, hopefully uh, look at their in a commercial way uh, and to um, you know approach it from a business standpoint because a lot of creatives you know create art uh, because one they enjoy it. Uh, and then if they could make uh, money from it, they would make money from their arts. And so what we have done is to kind of guide them through the maze uh, in D.C. and the great opportunities that exist in D.C. Uh, D.C. is one of the luckiest cities uh, in the nation by the commitment uh, that the district has to supporting the arts and artists. And so the commission who is sponsoring this, kudos to them. Uh, there is about uh, a combined sources of $30 million that is spent supporting the arts in DC. And a large portion of that goes uh, to support individual artists. And so I have uh, here with me also is going to uh, assist in this presentation is uh, Samuel Prather, who uh, is a practicing artist uh, himself and uh, he's an expert in branding. And so what we're gonna do is to focus this conversation uh, on you know, starting a business um, you know, in DC uh, and then also uh, branding yourself because we have gone, the arts is taking a substantial hit uh, since COVID. I, I you know, am a transplant from San Francisco, uh, been in the district uh, going on three years and have enjoyed uh, the arts throughout the district and every imaginable place from the Kennedy Center, uh, you know, has closed. And some businesses that have been in business that, you know, have supported different uh, disciplines in the arts, particularly in music, uh, have closed permanently. And so there's you know, facilities like the 18th Street Lounge. Uh, you had Twins uh, that has been in business, was in business in the district uh, over 40 years, which was a music venue that had, you know, jazz artists re regionally and nationally and locally. Uh, his clothes, uh, Soto's, which was a uh, place for emerging uh, artists, uh, has closed permanently. Uh, and then you, uh, Marvin's, uh, you know, is a place in the U Street area uh, as closed permanently. And so 
the creative arts, you know, has taken uh, a substantial hit in terms of brick and mortar uh, opportunities, but uh, there are, you know, other opportunities. The other thing that is kind of happening, you know, in the community is that uh, organized labor uh, has been uh, attacking the gig economy and, you know, independent contractors uh, as they focus on Uber and Lyft, which is beginning to have an impact on uh, individual artists as independent contractors uh, and people who operate in, quote, the gig economy, because you know, most artists sell individual pieces or, you know, individual performance. And so they are, you know, independent contractors. And so uh, the conversation that we're going to have is just to have you to begin to think about yourself uh, as a business and to talk about, you know, different strategies, how you can, uh, you know, establish a business. And so we always approach things from the standpoint that, you know, if you are going to uh, achieve your goals, that you need a plan. And so, you know, today we're going to talk about both, um, you know, business plan and also uh, a branding uh, plan to brand, whether it be your arts and crafts business uh, or your architectural business, uh, uh, because people have, you know, a variety of, of skills that, you know, are commercially uh, viable. Uh, where they can, you know, enhance their career and enhance their brand. And so, for example, when you apply to the commission uh, for uh, financial support, uh, an individual artist can uh, get they have two grants uh, currently. An individual artist can get up to $20,000, uh, one, to just do whatever they want to do with it, uh, to support them as an artist, to keep artists in the district. And the other one is to uh, do a specific project uh, that a uh, work that you're working on, but you need a body of work. Uh, and so you need, you know, kind of a strategy because that's what they're looking at you, you know, as a practicing artist and they're looking at you know, what is your body of work? What have you done in the past? And so that in itself kind of dovetails into, you know, a marketing uh, plan. So Sam, if you could, uh, could you put up the first uh, PowerPoint? So we, we have uh, you know, two uh, presentations which we will um, you know, provide to you. And so you don't necessarily have to take uh, uh, notes on this. Um, no, the, 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 uh, the other uh, presentation. That's the branding. Uh, This should be the, the first one. The branding one um, is different. You want the brand, the second one or the first one? The first one where it says artistic. Uh, I just sent it to you. Oh, oh, the PDF. Yes. Gotcha. Sorry about that. Oh. 
Okay, I think I figured it out. All right. Yeah. Can we see it? Yeah. It's yeah, so um, you know, the way we look at uh, you know the way artists can both access uh, you know the public funds that are available in DC, uh, and you know to also uh, grow their brand and business is that artists you know should look at themselves as entrepreneurs, and so entrepreneurs uh, generally uh, have a product or a service. Uh, that they want to provide to the marketplace that meets a need. One of the issues that we see you know, in the creative uh, community is that there are two categories uh, of people that the funders, uh, from a funder's perspective, but then also from a business perspective, is that there are two categories of uh, artists. And so there are creatives, and there's makers. And so you could go to the next slide. And so uh, we've heard that, you know, there's an arts and crafts business. And so those, you know, are people who are uh, makers and manufacture and assemble uh, products. Uh, creatives are people who do works in music and performance, writing, visual arts, print, digital design, film, television, crafts, uh, et cetera. And so uh, <clears throat> the way that the Arts Commission uh, and other funders in the arts, they look at people in those two different categories and they try, uh, when they judge people's works, they try to have people from the area. And so they have musicians judging musicians, writers, judging writers. And so um, uh, you should kind of look at yourself, you know, from a entrepreneurial standpoint, and you should have an individual uh, plan uh, for yourself as an individual artist and for your business. And there are numerous resources. We're one of 13 agencies funded by the city to provide uh, business technical assistance. And so there are numerous agencies all over the city uh, that will help you with that planning. But the suggestion is that you do seek some of those services and develop uh, a plan uh, for you as an individual artist and as a uh, business. Uh, you could go to the next slide. Um, and so, as I was saying, with the Arts Commission, with their heavy investment, and there are a number of other foundations uh, and venues uh, in the district that support the arts, and the marketplace uh, is a good place for creatives and makers to start, grow, and expand their business. Uh, we have over 49% uh, of the people uh, post or pre <laughs> Uh, uh, pandemic, you know, attended live uh, performances in our various theater uh, venues throughout the district. Uh, over 43% of the population attended art exhibits, uh, which is almost the highest in the nation. 43% uh, 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 that's a, uh, a duplicate, but the point is that uh, there is a high interest in the arts amongst the D.C. population that you don't find in a lot of places, and you also have substantial support uh, for artists uh, and creatives. And in order to access those funds, uh, most of those funders require that you have some type of uh, plan uh, that exhibits your body of work or describes your business. And so in the case you know, of arts and crafts, uh, there are, you know, grants that uh, they call dream grants, 
for those businesses to start. Uh, and then there's also a program made in TC, uh, which supports uh, a store concept that was started by an entrepreneur. It wasn't a city program. It was started by a local arts and craft entrepreneur. And so currently there are three made in DC stores and the concept is shared space. Uh, a shared space where different uh, makers can show their products uh, and sell them uh, in a shared kind of a art gallery type concept and there's strong support uh, from the city uh, for that activity. Uh, you could go to the next one. And so, um, uh, you know, in DC, um, <clears throat> people who, a lot of artists don't look at themselves, you know, commercially and don't have a plan. Uh, you know, the economic statistics say that if you live in DC and your income, you know, is below $80,000, uh, that is very difficult to survive in DC. And so a lot of artists, uh, you know, we have the term that you hear people say starving artists, uh, but that's not, you know, really, uh, when you create art, you're rich as a person uh, and in experience, but then, you know, economically, a lot of times uh, you uh, don't make your business successful uh, commercially, uh, because of, you know, a lack of planning. So it's, uh, you know, it's very important, uh, that you look at it in that way. And there's numerous ways that you can, uh, commercially sell your art. And so, uh, the education system, uh, we've cut art out of the education system, but the school systems, both the charter and public schools uh, hire artists uh, to teach during the day and in after school programs. And so there are you know, different ways to either use your skill or to sell your product. And so uh, uh, my uh, partner in crime today, uh, Mr. Prather is uh, you know, a musician uh, who also a large part of his business is teaching. And so uh, he was with a group uh, pre-pandemic uh, that organized the lessons uh, for him and he just showed up as an artist and taught. But then, uh, you know, when the pandemic occurred, uh, it created an opportunity for him to, you know, establish his own business uh, to provide direct services to the clients he had as opposed to working through that operation. And so when that opportunity was presented to him, he was confronted with the topics that we're talking today is, you know, how do you have a plan, uh, you know, to develop and manage and grow that business? And how do you structure yourself in a way, uh, you know, that you can be commercially successful? And so a lot of times we don't think about that uh, as a way because there's numerous ways that, you know, we can sell our art, whether we're a visual artist, uh, that piece of art can go on a cup, it could go on a t-shirt, uh, it could go on a marketing campaign, uh, and just as musicians can sell jingles uh, for... Uh, different advertisement uh, and things that are going on in D.C. In D.C., you know, we have, uh, you know, the nation's capital where there are numerous uh, associations, national associations that look to the arts, uh, you know, to design collateral materials for them. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunity out there. It's just that you have to have a plan uh, to approach it and network in the right way. Uh, you could go to the next one. And so in the district, there are some traditional uh, financial incentives. And so uh, we're going to talk about what the Arts Humanities Commission's 
uh, does. Uh, and so one of the programs that we work with, which is a great program, that if you have a brick and mortar, uh, they give up to $50,000 to improve your interior, exterior, and to buy equipment. And so this is how Made in D.C. got started. And so rather than going alone, uh, artists collaborated and came together and bought, you know, shared space. And so depending on what wards you are in D.C., a lot of the rent times, the rents are prohibitive uh, for artists to come together and create some type of collaborative. But, uh, you know, in the context of Made in D.C., if you have five artists sharing the rent or 10 or even 20 sharing it, it, it's possible to have a brick and mortar place to show and sell your art. And so this is one financial incentive. The other one is that uh, the DC Office of Cable and Television uh, supports not only large films that are done here, but they support even smaller video uh, production uh, projects. And so a lot of times uh, there are taxes associated with projects. And so they have a tax rebatement program and they also have where they give for smaller projects, financial contributions uh, to those projects uh, to make them happen. If you go to the next slide. And so then 202 Creates uh, is something that our current mayor, uh, Bowser, uh, created. And uh, there is, during the month of September, uh, there's a citywide focus on the arts and arts organizations. Uh, and so those, those are opportunities uh, that you could participate in uh, you know, by contacting them early on. And so they have in every neighborhood and ward different activities going on. And one of them is also, too, for branding purposes, uh, they have a studio. And in that studio, uh, you could get technical assistance to do podcasts. But I, I think the best resource there is a lot of times that our photos uh, that we have that show our products. Uh, or even us as an artist, uh, they have a state-of-the-art photography studio uh, with technical assistance where you could get some of the highest quality uh, photos. And this is a free resource uh, to all district residents. And so I would really, you know, kind of check them out. Uh, and then also, too, uh, twice a year, they... Uh, put together kind of a group of different artists uh, where they provide them technical assistance uh, to start and grow uh, their brand and their business. And so there's actual, uh, yeah, so it is a free service. Uh, the, you know, and so you just have to sign up uh, to get it. And so the lighting and all of that uh, stuff is really superior, and that's something that Sam will talk about. So this is a free resource to any uh, DC resident. I haven't followed, you know, what's going on there now, you know, in the pandemic situation, uh, but I am sure that that part, both the podcast and the photography part, uh, is still going on. But the uh, uh, classes that they run, uh, I am sure, has converted. Uh, to virtual. Uh, you could go to the next one. And so who's sponsoring this event today? It was the Commission uh, on Arts and Humanities. Uh, they are really, really there to support you. And so I would kind of follow what their programs are. They come out on an annual basis. Uh, the topics I have here are the general topics that they do sometimes depending on funding. Um, you know, the, the amounts go up and down. Uh, but as a just as an individual artist, 
you know, there is, you know, twenty thousand dollars, as I said, that is available to you as an artist if you develop a plan and develop a body of work. Uh, and then there is also the possibility uh, they have projects, uh, events, and festivals that you could propose uh, an idea for. And so I would follow that. Uh, their staff is very uh, friendly and open. It's best to contact them prior to <laughs> uh, uh, grants going out uh, so you can develop a relationship and, uh, and not you know, just call them in the crunch of when an opportunity is out there. And so I would follow uh, their website and, you know, there's no other city in the nation uh, that supports individual artists in the way uh, that the district uh, does. And so uh, those are some of the uh, financial incentives. Now what I'm gonna do is to kind of shift. DC is, you know, when you start a business in DC, it's kind of a maze because you can't go to one uh, entity to start your business. And so there are regulations. If you're selling anything in the district, most artists uh, don't incorporate their businesses. Um, but if you're selling anything in the district, uh, you're supposed to register your business, even if it is a sole proprietorship, and you're supposed to register with, uh, you know, the taxing authority. Uh, but a lot of artists, you know, are underground, and those artists that are underground uh, can't access the financial incentives that we just went over. And so there is really a benefit, uh, you know, to organizing your business, uh, and then a lot of times. You know, by organizing your business, you can keep control, you know, of your finances and write-offs. And so a lot of times we buy materials and software and instruments and canvases and things of that nature, which we don't kind of keep track of. And so in the long run, you know, it's, it's, it's beneficial uh, to organize yourself and to come into the system. So could you go to the next slide? And so uh, in organizing your business in DC, uh, I'm gonna go through these uh, nine steps. There's really two DC agencies that you deal with. And one is the Department of uh, Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, uh, commonly known as DCRA. Uh, that is where you incorporate your business and get your business license and get your certificate of occupancy, whether or not you're working out of the home or you're in a brick and mortar place. Then the other uh, agency is uh, the uh, DC Office of Tax and Revenue, commonly known as OTR. Um, uh, and so at OTR, they uh, give you your uh, business identification number, and they also give you your clean hands. And so DC has a rule that you can't dip your hand in the public till if you owe the district more than a hundred dollars. And so a lot of artists, um, you know, sometimes have never filed, <laughs> uh, you know, taxes at all. Uh, and so they're not in the system in that way. Uh, uh, but when you incorporate a business, they're looking at the business, not the individual. Uh, the other thing as an individual, if you've made, you know, below the amount, uh, to file taxes, that doesn't mean don't file, you could still file. Uh, and so in order to get a clean hands, uh, you can work out those situations where you can access uh, commission funding, uh, uh, but they would require, if you're going as an individual, to have a clean hands. And so you can get it by working out uh, with OTR a plan, a payment plan or something of that nature. And so that would allow you to do it. 
if you incorporate a business and as an individual, you don't have a clean hands, they don't look to you as an individual, they look to the business. And so the business keeps the clean hands by staying up with the regulatory uh, relations in terms of filing uh, the reports uh, that are required, you know, as a business. And so the steps are going through the maze. You first uh, register your business with DCRA. And so that would be simply uh, articles of incorporation. If you're a corporation, articles of organization. If you are a uh, LOC, um, and so you register your business and to go through all of this process, it's about, uh, you know, $650 to go through the entire process. Uh, and so your incorporation is generally, uh, $220. And then from there you file with the IRS to get your, uh, employer identification number. Uh, which is free online. You can automatically get it uh, at the time that you apply for it. Uh, in terms of incorporating your business, it generally takes them three business days to incorporate you unless you pay an expedited fee uh, of $100, which is not worth uh, doing that. And then once you get your tax ID from the uh, Internal Revenue Service, you file what is called a FR 500 uh, with OTR, and they will mail to you uh, within three business days your identification number, and that will come uh, in the mail. Um, and from there, uh, you once you receive that certificate, uh, that's step four. Once you receive the certificate, uh, you can file for a clean hands for that new entity that you created. DC now has an online process. You'll hear this term, clean hands, clean hands, where's your affidavit for clean hands? You can automatically go online and get a clean hands at any time uh, immediately if you've registered uh, with OTR and have your registration uh, number. Uh, then after that, you apply for a certificate of occupancy or a permit for your home-based business. DC now has a combined process uh, that since everything's online where you can apply for that certificate at the same time that you apply for your business license. And so you will receive uh, both of those at the same time. And so that you know, fee, depending on what type of business you are, is generally around, uh, for both of them, uh, it's generally, you know, close to $400. Um, and so then step seven, if you are no, uh, nobody with us today or in the, is in the food service business, those businesses require uh, additional licensing. Uh, and so you would have to apply uh, for those additional licenses if you did. And then uh, once you have your business license, a lot of people file for a trade name uh, to do their business under. And so you would, uh, you know, kind of do that. And so, you know, this is a maze, but there's technical assistance available. Our agency does it. There's technical assistance available all over the city if you decide to do this to help walk you through uh, this process because it gets confusing to a number of people with the number of agencies uh, that you have to deal with, um, you know, to complete this process. You know, our recommendation generally, you know, to artists is to begin to think about uh, applying uh, to become a business. One, because that allows you to access resources. Uh, and two, uh, it allows you to grow uh, your business. And so, uh, you know, the technical assistance is available to you and it's free. Uh, and so then uh, now we're going to kind of shift 
to talking about branding yourself and branding your business because uh, that's kind of important, uh, particularly to the uh, Arts and Humanities Commission because they want to know, uh, you know, who you are as an artist uh, or who is your arts organization uh, and what kind of work you've done in the past. And so now I'll turn it over uh, to Mr. Prather. Before before I um, hand it over to Mr. Prather, I just wanted to um, ask and make sure that there weren't any questions. I don't see any in the chat at the immediate moment. Um, and I know we started off the meeting uh, bringing in people and telling, uh, and telling us who we are and what discipline. Um, I see that we have an extra uh, person, Kwesi, within the um, group. Do, did you want to uh, be able to take that feedback or would you like us to wait until um, the end of the presentation so that we can have that? We can have questions. If people have questions at this point, it's appropriate, yeah. Okay. So I don't see any coming in at the immediate moment. Um, and so, okay, with that being said, I'm not going to hold you off, uh, Mr. Prather. So there aren't any questions. Everybody feel free to ask any questions while you're listening to this presentation, um, as we do want to engage the audience and answer any questions that people may have as it pertains to the presentation. So please don't hesitate. Please don't be shy. We're friendly. Um, this is a loving environment and we're here to help. Um, thank you. Okay, well, uh, I suppose I should start off uh, by introducing uh, myself a little bit. Um, my name is Samuel Prather. I do a whole bunch of things in the artistic realm uh, and I do a couple of things on the business realm to kind of support those artistic things um, that I do. Um, and I, uh, I studied visual arts at uh, UMBC, um, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and I got a degree in uh, um, imaging and digital arts. I was also double majoring in music, but ended up finishing uh, my degree in music at UDC um, and uh, getting my master's in music at Howard University. Um, so um, most of my uh, kind of talents branch from those two disciplines, visual arts and music. Um, I have done everything from photography, videography, um, graphic design, web design on the visual side, as well as um, kind of the more fine art stuff like, um, you know, painting and, and, and uh, um, man, my art teacher would kill me. I've done kiln kiln firing of, of uh, uh, kiln fired vessels and uh, you name it, like a, a, a lot of different things on the artistic side. Uh, and then on um, uh, on the more corporate side of that visual thing, uh, I've done some work with my sister's photography company, um, Imagine Photography, and I've operated as a, a photographer for events like weddings, for Congressional Black Caucus, for uh, concerts, etc as well as uh, the video side of those same type of events, um, uh, as well as commercials. Um, I've been doing some documentary filmmaking as well. Um, and I also, on the music side, um, have played uh, with a lot of kind of, uh, you know, folks that you might recognize, mostly as a side man. I have a couple um, projects that I've done um, myself I've, as, a, as a producer. Um, or composer, uh, I think I have uh, worked on almost 20 records now, um, uh, give or take, um, and you know won a couple of awards for you know uh, uh, my jazz performance uh, um, uh, things that I, to support what I was doing at Howard University. So long story short, I've done a lot of work in the creative um, sphere, and I also teach uh, on the music side as well. Um, as kind of con uh, consult and, and write charts, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty much uh, I have a wife and three kids and one on the way. So anything that I can do to make it easy for somebody to pay me, I try to do. 
Um, so I'm going to pull up um, just a, a, some basics about branding. And I'm going to try to uh, not take up too much time. So, you know, uh, you all, uh, Quan or, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Moderator, just let me know uh, how I'm doing. Uh, let me share this with you really quickly, though. I'm not going to share it the whole time, though, because it's not really, these are really more uh, kind of notes for myself. So um, let's see here. Share screen. All right. So getting started. Um, let's go here. Okay. So. Uh, as far as branding is concerned, you want to make sure that you uh, have a mission. And and the if you take nothing else from anything that I say today, the biggest thing is consistency. All right, I'll say that again. Consistency, consistency, consistency um, is key. Um, but yeah, what are a few words that would best describe the goal of your company? Uh, what values do you want the company to represent? Why did you choose this and why are you uniquely suited? And these are things that you need to not only be able to tell your customer, but these are things that you want to know for yourself um, when you're starting a business so that you can make sure that it's something that you're going to be able to support with your own motivation as opposed to just something that you think is going to make you a couple dollars. Because in my experience, if you're just trying to make a couple dollars, you're not going to put the effort in um, that. Uh, people that are doing something that is their passion are going to put into it. And so you want to make sure that you are doing something that is your passion and finding a way to make um, that profitable as opposed to uh, trying to be passionate about something that you think might be mildly profitable. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. So um, that comes down to managing your image online. Um, I think for a lot of folks in, in, my generation and generations um, above me, uh, this is a very foreign idea. We're used to uh, brick and mortar. We're used to newspaper ads. We're used to uh, maybe seeing advertising on the side of a bus and billboards and uh, things of that nature. That is not the world that we live in today. I mean, those things still have a place, but really where people go to see if you're legit is online, I would say the vast majority of people make a decision on whether or not they uh, want to even mess with what you're doing based on a Google search. So if you have uh, no control over uh, what comes up first uh, when somebody searches you on Google, then you're an extreme disadvantage um, to anyone who, who is actively thinking about those things. So let's take a second and talk about um, your image. Right. So uh, what visually encapsulates all aspects of your mission? So we talked about what your mission is. But now we have to talk about having a visual representation of those things. Um, and this is a place where stealing is great because um, what companies have a branding uh, and communications that are, are similar to yours. Um, if you see, for example, if you're um, selling outdoor apparel um, for camping, then it is a very good thing for you to be looking at L.L. Bean or um, J. Crew or whoever else are, are the biggest uh, dog on the block and seeing what makes their, uh, their communication effective. Um, they've spent millions of dollars uh, probably on these things. And so it is a great advantage for you to be able to just kind of look and see, at least from the outside, uh, what things that they're doing uh, and not doing to create consistency and uh, communicate their mission. Uh, how do you integrate those, the core of those strengths on a smaller scale? So obviously you don't have, uh, I want to say obviously, some of you might be on here, you, you know, uh, might be somebody from Macy's board sitting on here, but I doubt it. Uh, most of you probably are, are dealing with a, a, a smaller budget, so you can't drop a couple million dollars on an advertising campaign this Christmas. Um, so there's no sense in kind of um, uh, 
of, of trying to duplicate those strengths um, of a larger company's marketing plan. But there are smaller things that you can do um, even with no budget uh, or at least a small budget that can help you be much more consistent and make a much better impression with your customers online. Um, and the other thing is uh, how do, uh, let me see, how do you, I, that might be a type here. How do your companies see you uh, and, and how do you want to be seen? I think really what I meant there is how is your company seen and how do you want to be seen? Um, but you want to make sure that you're very, very careful and intentional. That's another, um, like I would probably say that's the second most important word. So consistent uh, would be the biggest word uh, to take away. But if you're going to take away two words, consistent um, and also intentional. Um, because anything that you don't do intentionally is probably going to be done for you unintentionally uh, and probably not in the way that you would want it. All right, so yeah, so that goes along with what I'm saying. If you don't do it, then somebody else will. Um, if you don't de if you don't define your presence online, uh, then you will, you know, you'll be uh, um, not pleased with with what Google, you know, Google's results will pull up for you. Um, what I would, I think, the last time I did this, I pulled up a couple people's. Um, uh, website, but you can do that uh, uh, kind of on your own. Just look up your business's web website, like just type in your name or type in your business um, if you have a business name and see what the search results are. And think about it from the standpoint of if you were the customer, is what you find something that would inspire confidence? Because at the end of the day, what we're still asking people to do is give their email address, give their credit card number to a stranger. So you can't have any inconsistency um, and you don't want to leave that up to someone else uh, to craft for you. So just look at your biggest competitor or even if you're not big enough to call them a competitor yet, but look at the big dog in your industry. Look at what comes up when you search them and then take a look at yourself and compare. And then now we can see what we can actually kind of what differences we can make up uh, without spending, you know, a whole bunch of money. Um, the first thing that you can do uh, is images. Um, and I'm going to give you just a, a quick um, photography crash course, um, especially for those of you that have uh, an arts background. I know uh, we have an artist, an architect. Uh, in an art and craft studio. So you probably already know um, most of this, if not all of it, but you know, uh, stop me if this is, if this is um, overkill, I mean, uh, just re uh, repetitive, but you wanna make sure that everything is lit well in your photos. Um, and, and you wanna make sure that you're using uh, soft light as opposed to hard light. Uh, if you look at uh, the image of me right now as I'm speaking, I have a big soft box over here um, that's providing the light that's hitting this side of my face. Um, and that soft box is about like 32, 36 inches, I believe. Um, so it's a big light source. So bigger light sources have nicer drop off of, of light as opposed to casting nasty hard shadows, which is a, a dead giveaway of a cheap uh, image. Um, and then also you want to make sure that you're filling the frame with your content, right? Uh, and, or, your de, uh, or your desired message. So you want to make sure um, that what, like there's not a whole bunch of dead space in your image. Um, so if I want you to listen to me as a speaker, if I'm only taking up this much of the frame and I'm, uh, you know, that's not a very good image for, uh, attracting clients. Um, so, you know, you just want to make sure that you fill the frame up with your desired message or with your subject. And also what you want to do, if uh, possible, is by either by lighting or by use of focus and out of focus, or um, there's a, a lot of different things that you can use, but you separate the subject of your photo from the background. So um, my kind of general rule of thumb when I'm taking um, a photo is I want 
the photo to be a good shot, like an interesting shot without me in it or without my product in it. Uh, and if it's an interesting shot and it works by itself, then it's going to work even better when you place the product or the subject into um, the frame. So uh, don't 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 get caught out there with, uh, you know, that 15 year old picture, um, you know, uh, uh, on, you know, on 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 your Google uh, as your first result, um, because uh, it's it's not that expensive to do better. Um, and a couple ways that you can do it really cheap. So even if you don't have a fancy camera, so I would say obviously the first way to get a great, you know, uh, headshot or a great pot product shot is go get a professional to do it. But uh, everybody can't always afford that. So uh, most people have a fairly capable camera sitting right there in their pocket. Uh, if you have an iPhone uh, or an Android, you know, uh, that was, you know, put out in the last uh, uh, five years, uh, you probably have a great camera uh, and the ability to take good photos with it. Um, the main thing that stops people from doing uh, good photos with their phone, in my opinion, is composition. Uh, composition and lighting. So those two things, uh, if you become a master of those two things, uh, then you'll be able to get good shots uh, um, with, with even an iPhone um, as long as you kind of follow those basic rules. Um, the other thing to consider when you're using a phone um, to shoot is that there's different levels of quality available uh, on a phone. There's some third-party apps that will let you have more control. Um, the regular app on the iPhone, for example, is completely automatic and won't let you control things like ISO, aperture, et cetera. But there are apps that will let you control those things from your phone. So if you use a third-party app to have a little bit more control over those things, then you can do even more um, with your phone. The other thing that I'll say about um, uh, uh, shooting images with your phone uh, or images in general, just for my work as a professional photographer, is shoot more but present less. So shoot a ton of photos. If you want a good headshot, if you want a good product shot, um, don't be afraid to shoot, um, you know, 50 shots. Don't be afraid to shoot 100 shots. Um, you can just delete anything that you don't use later. And that way, if, you know, you have the perfect expression, but I don't know, maybe there's, uh, uh, you know, your eyes are halfway closed or there's, uh, um, you know, there's a, a bunch of little, in, a little things that can kind of go wrong in a photo. The more photos you shoot, the better the chances of you getting one that actually looks the way that you want it to. Um, and so the hard part is just kind of disciplining yourself to take more photos um, if you don't have, like I said, access to a professional photographer. Uh, so I would say the biggest difference between a professional photographer and an amateur photographer um, when you see their work is that you tend to see much less of of, of professional photo uh, prof uh, photographers' uh, work and portfolio than they shoot. Um, when I shoot a wedding, sometimes I might um, shoot between a thousand and two thousand photos. Um, the client doesn't get two thousand photos; they get the best uh, photos that I, I I shoot out of there. And it might you know it might be a couple hundred, um, but the the couple hundred that I deliver are going to be uh, much better because of the uh, 1,500 that the client never saw. Um, so kind of have that kind of attitude if you're trying to create visual content for your own business. Um, don't think that you're just going to, you know, snap a selfie, take two of those, and then one of those is going to be great for a professional portrait. Um, any questions on this before? Because I know that's a lot. Any questions on that? So I don't see any questions immediately in the chat, but as what I will, I would like to ask is because I dabble in, you know, the creative side myself. Um, and I appreciate this specific topic because I have struggled with pictures and it's great to hear, you know, some strategies around getting better shots. Um, and just understanding that people don't necessarily use all of their shots. 
Um, but what I would ask though is I do more graphic design than I do um, just like visuals. Well, more of my visuals are pertain, contain, are uh, built around my fashion and my clothing. Um, and so I appreciate that. But when it comes to say like a graphic designer or another visual artist, um, what rule of thumb would you use? As I as I appreciate you saying like create more and like reserve less as I think that can be applied to all. But if we're talking to like, say another um, visual artist where you're not necessarily having to worry about like light and things of that, but also branding, um, what would you be able to speak to that, if anything? Sure, okay, so uh, I just wanted to make, yeah, I'm gonna get to um, uh, um, the branding stuff a little bit more specifically in a second, but as far as the, um, the the visual presence if you're a visual artist like a graphic artist um it still is going to come down to um the quality that you scan images or or export images um and and still less is more um so so picking your best stuff you're you're uh as an artist you're you're really only um, as, as if you're a photographer, you know, your, your, your strongest, you know, three to five photographs are the only thing that we should see on your site. Um, I don't, um, you want to, you want the best stuff that you have to offer. Um, and then even if you are a graphic artist, you're still selling yourself. So like, it, it doesn't matter what discipline is, what the discipline is or um, uh, what type of art it is that you're that you're selling, you still have to sell yourself, or you're uh, or you're going to be leaning on the strength of uh, of your work instead of using um, your personality, which is why most people buy things anyway. So um, you know, people will support a graphic artist because of things like, oh, they have a great turnaround, really professional. They uh, um, you know, have all the all the software uh, and, and stuff to do to, to do the type of stuff that I want. But at the end of the day, what people really are making their decision on is my experience with that person uh, um, working. Are they, you know, are they nice? You know, are they responsive, et cetera, et cetera. And so as a as a customer, you have to remember people are making decisions yes or no on every aspect of your business from the time that they see your link on google or search for your name uh until the time that they leave um uh with your product uh so uh you just want to make sure that you start it's kind of like i mean uh you know for lack of a better um uh, uh parallel like dating it's not like um you don't you don't go sit down on the first date and then go brush your hair when you're at the table, right? You want to make sure that you're presenting the best that you have right up front, um, uh, and 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 that helps your chances uh, of getting a second invitation. So, um, hopefully, that kind of helps. Uh, does that does that answer your question? Um, yes, it does. Okay. Um, if there's no more uh, before I moved on from 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 the uh, photography thing, because uh, that is actually a really, really important thing. Um, I just wanted to make sure every, you know, no, no questions before I moved on from that. Um, so let me go ahead and get back to my uh, my PowerPoint here. OK. Hello. Was that somebody asking? Oh, we're good. Okay. The last thing on that page is uh, um, edit in post, but no green screen. Um, so what? Uh, what? I, so so, you know, yes, you can use Photoshop to maybe remove some blemishes or correct some things, but please do not try to green screen yourself into something um, uh, for for a professional uh, shot on your website. There is a ton um, of reasons not to. Um, visually, it's very hard to get the lighting to match um, um, when you shoot that photo for green screen to match 
the location of wherever that green screen background is coming from. And anything inauthentic is generally going to read as cheap uh, and unprofessional. So that's the last thing that you want anybody's first impression of you to be. So, you know, um, you, you, you want to think, you want to shoot with the background in mind um, and, and um, you make use of good lighting, good composition. Uh, and uh, if you have a little money, then you get a professional to come in uh, and, and shoot those for you. Okay, so um, as far as developing a customer base, um, the question is, uh, isn't whether or not there's customers that will support you. Um, I think that's, um, you know, where are people? Well, like we live in Washington, D.C. There's probably a million people with, inside the Beltway. Uh, so it's, there's not, it's, it's not a question of whether or not there are people. It's just how will you find them? What will you do to find those people? Um, and uh, uh, regardless of your business, I think that uh, if you have an email list or customer, it's a good idea to maybe do um, a survey and just try to figure out who those people are. Uh, who is your ideal client? Where do they live? Uh, what kind of music do they listen to? What kind of magazines, books, newspapers, etc.? You want <clears throat> as much information as you can, especially about people that have purchased stuff from you. Um, and uh, you want to basically take that, like average out who that person is, and then focus advertising on people that are similar um, to it. And the reason I say you want to get some information from people about this as opposed to just guessing, um, because a lot of times we see ourselves as our customer base when we might have a very different view of ourselves than what's realistically um, our, our target market. Uh, so, for example, uh, as a musician, you know, um, I might say, oh, well, you know, I want uh, 20 to 25 year olds that like X and X type of music. When in reality, um, you know, my client base might be 35 to 40 year olds that um, like, you know, this and this type of music. And so we have to do as much as we can to get ourselves out of the way um, and deal with what is there rather than uh, kind of making assumptions based on uh, a wish list in our head of an ideal customer. Um, and uh, where can we find that person online? So once we find out who that person is, uh, that 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 target customer uh, that would uh, probably most likely respond to uh, things that we're trying to market, where can we find them online? And that's why you need that information, um, because you know I'm sure all of us have gone on uh, eBay or Amazon uh, looking for something, and then we click over to YouTube or we click over to Facebook and we see an advertisement for the thing that we're looking for right there on the right side of the screen. And it's probably, you know, on sale today or something. Um, this is not an accident. This is the way that the big boys uh, make money. They, they find out um, the, the most they can about their customers because the more you know about your customers, then the cheaper it is to advertise uh, to them per person. Uh, and so that's really what the game is, is about ratcheting down the, the cost of advertising um, uh, to your target market. And once you've gotten to the point where it's cheaper to advertise to them, like you bring in more from your ads than, um, than what you're spending on them, then you're, all, then you're good to go. Then you just scale up. Um, so that's the idea. Um, the other thing, uh, I was listening to uh, um, a story on NPR, um, and it was about um, customer experience. And they interviewed the uh, founder of Airbnb. Uh, and he said that what he was trying to do, he was always in constant contact with the, the people that were in the pilot program for his Airbnb. And it's a great one to check out. So it's on the archives in uh, uh, NPR, I believe. Um, but they were like, I think, I think the uh, series is How'd You Build That or something like that, if you want to check it out. But they're like, how? what would be a four-star experience for you? Uh, is one of the questions he would ask. And then 
uh, you know, they would go through, um, you know, their 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 rental or uh, uh, with the Airbnb, and they would ask for fear uh, feedback. And and once he got to a point where he could consistently get a four star rating out of people, he said, okay, well, what would make that a five star rating? Um, you know, and and you know, people would say, well, maybe if I had tickets to a concert or you know, um, you know, uh, knew that there was a party that was coming up uh, nearby the location, and they started adding things like that. Um, and you know, up until the point where they were like, "What would this be like if you were a rock star? What would be the ten star um, experience?" And uh, I challenge all of you to create that experience for your customers. And I know that's difficult as an artist sometimes to think that way because we don't think about um, like we we call our customers patrons, right? We even call them a different name. Um, but I think we do ourselves a disservice by uh, by uh, acting as if um, these people aren't a customer that need to have a good experience the same way uh, as you do when you walk into a Starbucks or or uh, a Target or you know something like that. We want to make sure that people are greeted by the uh, the things that we want them to take away um, from the experience with us. So uh, whether I'm selling paintings or uh, uh, or graphic design, um, the we want to make as close to a 10 star experience for our customers um, and find the scalable elements of those. Obviously we can't recreate that for every customer, but find the scalable elements um, that we can uh, reproduce uh, on, on larger scale. Uh, and that's how you kind of grow uh, into a larger, uh, larger business. So uh, we don't need a lot of, cause I think the, 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 uh, the miscon there's a misconception that you need um, this just huge amount of customers, especially now with the internet. Everybody thinks that you know I'm uh, just going to sell a, a million of these little things, and that that's what's going to kind of pay the bills. But it turns out to be kind of the opposite. Uh, we're really looking for the super fan. We're looking for that one person who is going to love your painting or um, uh, love your work as an architect and love your work, uh, 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 love what you sell as an art and craft studio and come back and keep on buying things over and over again. Those are much better targets uh, and you need fewer of them because they come back. Uh, so if you can't get those clients without creating that great experience for the customer. Um, and uh, remember we said, if you take nothing else away from what I'm saying today, be consistent. Um, and uh, also be intentional, right? So be consistent, be intentional. Uh, in, intentional. Um, so we want to be consistent in that customer experience. Uh, we want to make sure from platform to platform, um, if they see us on Facebook, are we using the same logo, uh, you know, uh, same color scheme, uh, same type of quality of pictures? Um, because inconsistency scares people. Once again, we're asking for their email address and you know, uh, and their credit card number. Um, so inconsistency is not something that uh, we want to uh, to project. Um, now, I already talked a little bit about uh, uh, online uh, just ads, uh, but I just want to briefly uh, watch. Uh, you know, go through a couple things that you should know uh, about Facebook, Google, etc. Um, Facebook. Uh, if you're if you're trying to promote something, um, Facebook gets more views. Um, so if I put up a video on Facebook, you know, versus YouTube, I'm going to get more views on Facebook. But that's partially because of the way that Facebook counts. Um, so Facebook basically gives a view for almost any interaction um, with your content uh, versus YouTube. Um, which has some very kind of narrow and strict rules for what counts as a view. And they have to be unique viewers. You don't get another view uh, if you watch uh, from, the same, uh, uh, from the same computer. If you watch a video 20 times, um, it's not going to give you 20 views from it. Um, so you just have to kind of know uh, the rules on it and, and kind of uh, plan accordingly. Uh, so... Uh, a lot of times people think I'm just going to throw up a, a couple videos on YouTube and, you know, uh, 
you know, if people, it'll blow up, go viral, and then I'll get a check from YouTube. Um, it's much harder to monetize on YouTube uh, than people think. Uh, you need, uh, just to get your first check from them, you need 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours within the last year uh, before you even get that first check from them. Um, so uh, that's quite a bit of content, uh, quite a bit of, of, of time for people viewing it. So that's not something um, that I would plan on as like my, my business plan uh, unless you really uh, are dedicated uh, to, you know, releasing content on a regular basis um, and, 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 and spending um, money as well to advertise that channel. Um, and the other thing uh, I want to say about like advertising online in terms of Facebook and Google is that you don't get a viral video by accident. I mean, I think that um, sometimes when we, f you know, flip through our feed and we see, um, you know, the cat peeing on, you know, on the toilet, you know, or stuff like that. Those kinds of things don't really apply um, to the artistic uh, advertisement model. Um, so uh, if you see somebody that has thousands of views consistently or millions of views, uh, it's because they are making certain decisions that make it easier for their content to be found and viewed by a lot of people. Um, there are no more accidents. The 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 Online sphere is way too crowded um, to have anybody accidentally sneak in and compete with people that are spending millions of dollars and uh, hours and hours and hours uh, um, crafting their online personas. Um, yeah, uh, funnels, I'm just gonna, you know, uh, most ads that you see um, um, about marketing online are, are some kind of marketing funnel. and a marketing funnel is just a business communication that's intended to start real big at the top with a lot of people and then kind of whittle down at that group of people that uh, get into the funnel down to uh, people that are most likely to buy. Um, uh, if you set up that properly, it can be something that is a great return on investment for you. And I was mentioning earlier, once you get to a point where um, the amount of money generated from your ad buy exceeds your ad buy, then you're already a winning. Uh, and so it's just a time, just a matter of scaling up. Um, those can and should be automated. Uh, nobody does these things uh, by hand. There, there are a great ones that you can kind of buy online. There's whole sets of funnels that have um, the first uh, email that your customer receives upon signing up to your advertisement. Um, and then responses, et cetera. This, it's, it's really actually kind of scary how uh, automated these things are. Uh, but yeah, that's not something that you should be spending time on once you've created um, these, uh, these several emails that you want your first, um, you want your customers' interactions to be um, with you. There's a book on it by Rick Bronson. Um, oh man, do I have uh, Dot com secrets. Um, goes into a lot of the way that these funnels work. Um, so yeah, check that book out. Uh, of course, it is in itself a funnel uh, because he's a marketing guy. Uh, so of course he's trying to sell, uh, he's trying to upsell you, uh, but you can still uh, take a lot of great information away from it, uh, even if you don't decide to purchase. Um, there's cheaper ways to kind of make click funnels um, uh, a part of your web presence. Um, I would say his is on, on the more expensive side, but it's if you have the money, uh, it's less of a headache. So it's just kind of like you know uh, an Apple uh, computer. Like if you don't have to know code and everything to use it, it's just kind of uh, um, easy to integrate. Uh, but you can definitely do it for cheaper, uh, especially if you're willing to put a little bit of elbow grease uh, into creating your own funnels. Um, also, um, the other advantage of funnels is that uh, once you've demonstrated that um, your funnel can create uh, um, return on investment, it's a much easier sell to get people with money to invest in your business. So if you have a click funnel that um, is generating 6% um, 
eight percent, ten percent uh, return on investment. That's what ROI is. If I didn't uh, explain that earlier, return on investment. Um, but if you have great ROI on one of your click funnels, then you can walk to somebody who actually has some real money, uh, angel investors and uh, um, and uh, uh, capital uh, uh, firms. There are people out here with money that are looking for places to invest in. Um, uh, sitting in a checking account and stuff like that is not what people with a lot of money do. They don't want their money to sit still. They want their money to work for them. So if you have um, a funnel that's demonstrated that it can consistently bring in 6 to 10%, um, then anybody that has a lot of money would be silly not to be like, okay, well, this time let's do it again with 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 more money. Let's, let's scale up. Um, I also touched on... Uh, on this um, uh, look like audiences and algorithms um, if if you're not familiar with a look alike audience um, it is the reason why the advertising in your inbox looks the way it does um, you might flip through your email and be like man how they know my credit is jacked up or uh, you know anything you know but the the Lookalike audiences are basically when somebody does a big bulk advertising ad buy and they see who responds to the advertising. And based on the people who responded positively to the advertising, they then use that. Um, I'm sorry, they, I'm saying they, but Facebook um, can use that information uh, um, to set up a set of parameters um, to find customers that are similar. Um, so uh, the, the way that they do this is not something that they share, but please believe it is, it is diabolically effective. Um, so if you are able to do, uh, you know, an ad buy and, and kind of figure out who those target customers are online, Facebook will help you find millions more of them to, to, to push your ads to uh, based on, um, on, on, you know, uh, countless parameters uh, so that, you know, your advertising will be more effective. And you can even do a, you can do a lookalike audience from a lookalike audience ad buy. So if you do an advertisement just to your lookalike audience, you can see who responds to that and make another lookalike audience based on who said yes to that. So that's what I mean when I say big businesses keep on tightening um, the specificity on who they're advertising to. And that's what makes things cheap. So um, if I know that it costs me, um, let's say, uh, five cents for somebody to see my ad right um and i'm all and i'm and i'm just blanket advertising to hundreds of people um uh and not necessarily knowing the quality of that ad buy uh that can really really uh put me at a disadvantage to somebody who's spending um you know less than one cent per ad uh, per person that sees their ad and everybody that sees their ad is somebody who's likely to buy. So quick question. In terms of um, doing the lookalike audiences and using kind of a mass marketing strategy to figure out who kind of uh, would interact with your content, is it a workaround in, in not using Facebook, say, a service like MailChimp, and let's say I just have uh, access to 500 emails, and I know those 500 people in varying degrees, right? Would, would that be a similar tactic to what it is you're talking about in terms of the mass marketing uh, kind of strategy, in terms of trying to just get feedback and engaging, like, taking from that who engaged me, let's say 20 of those were women. I look at that and then maybe 10 were men and I take those numbers and then make another lookalike pool. You know, 
Um, it's it's the same concept, but it has nowhere near the same amount of power. Um, the advantage that Facebook brings to the table is that when somebody reacts to an ad uh, on Facebook, Facebook knows everything about them. It knows where they've been. It knows what political leanings they have, what magazines and websites they frequent. It knows what they eat. It knows what they buy. It knows, um, you know, all those things about you. I mean, we've all, uh, you know, if you fill it out one of those stupid surveys on Facebook, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, like they know everything. That's, that's their business model. Their business model is we give you this free service in air quotes, right? Free so that we can learn about you, right? This is the, uh, um, and, and the more that they know about you, the more effective their, their, um, they look like uh, uh, audiences are. So that's really why um, they're worth all that money to advertisers uh, is because they know that if they, if you, if I run an ad on Facebook uh, and I, um, let's say I do a, a, uh, a, a, you know, $250 ad buy and, and it reaches uh, um, the ad gets seen by, uh, uh, you know, 5,000 people, let's say. Uh, be, with the with the original parameters that I did my ad on, so um, uh, I'm 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 AMC Widget Company. I did a, 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 a ad buy for uh, what I think is my target market. So my email list of uh, 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 men 30, 30 to to fifty um, that that uh, you know like Home Depot or you know like that might be my the, the parameters of the first ad. Um, I might only get, um, you know, a hundred people that actually looked at the ad for, for more than, you know, for a second or more. If I make a lookalike audience from those people that responded, that watched my video, now I might have uh, uh, that lookalike audience. See, Facebook doesn't tell me necessarily what those parameters are that connect these people, right? But... Facebook can take these hundred people and compare everything without giving me any information about, you know, I, you know, like any of their personal information, but it can make a profile of those hundred people that you would never be able to make. So, um, you know, uh, for, for, you might think that Home Depot was the straw that connected these hundred people, or, or it might be the, uh, um, it might be uh, a certain type of tool set or something. When in reality, um, out of these hundred people, uh, maybe eighty of them are NFL fans. Maybe uh, uh, maybe sixty of them have a subscription um, to uh, a car magazine. Maybe uh, you know uh, fifty of them. Are, are 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 in the NRA. You know, you know, just random stuff that you would never even think to ask or know about another human being. Um, and so that's really where the uh, where the power of a lookalike audience comes into play because Facebook does know those things and they can advertise to. So once they narrow down this hundred, they say, okay, well, these hundred people like the Green Bay Packers. Uh, um, uh, uh, Home Depot and uh, I don't know NASCAR. They can uh, and and along with thirty other commonalities, right? They can give you um, um, without actually giving you the contact information. They can give you a list of a million people that fit the same, or a hundred thousand people, or you know that fit the same profile. And so um, when you run your next ad, you run your profile to them. You see what I'm saying? So, um, and, and this is a process that all, that like any business that's doing online marketing is constantly doing. They're constantly tightening up their lookalike audience because every time they narrow it down, the likelihood of a sale goes up, the likelihood of a sale goes up, and the cost of advertising goes down. All right. Um, let me uh, take a look here, make sure there's not any, because I think we're getting down to the end of. Um... I had a general question <clears throat> yes. in terms of, uh, you know, most artists post their stuff through uh, Instagram. Okay. Um, 
what is more effective in terms of reaching customers or are both effective? Uh, email versus Instagram. I don't think there's a versus anything. Uh, uh, this is, unfortunately, you have to be an octopus. Um, you have to have a presence on Instagram. You have to have a presence on um, on Facebook. You have to have a website. Um, you probably have to have a, a, a Twitter um, account as well. Um, and all of these things should be something that you do on a kind of regular basis, and it should all say the same thing about your business. Um, so, um, you know, certain things like um, uh, certain things don't translate as well. Um, for example, ask, you know, uh, uh, Instagram, uh, it's, it's more effective to advertise in a square because you take up more real estate on the phone where most people are using it um, versus Facebook, which might be more likely to be seen at home on a computer or email, um, which uh, where, where graphics might not be as important. Um, so all these things, but you, you kind of have to do all of them, unfortunately. Like I, I can't promise that doing all of these things is going to be some night and day improvement um, in your bottom line. But what I can say is that if you're not doing it, you are definitely pouring water into a bucket with a hole in the bottom. In the chat, uh, people are saying that they don't, they hate checking their emails and they love Instagram and Instagram is faster. And I was just thinking in terms of converting customers to make purchases. Dig it. So, so when you're talking about, um, uh, one second, let me take a look at the chat so I can kind of keep up with, I think, um, uh, I think that people have to understand, uh, um, that the goal is to get somebody signed up to your email list. That's where we want them. Um, yes, it's it's cool to to uh, to get that first interaction uh, on Instagram or Facebook, um, but our main goal is to get these people into our list so that we can we can get them into our uh, email marketing funnel. Um, we want. Um, because you you can't you can't do uh, uh, you can't automate a marketing funnel on Instagram. Um, so, uh, for example, if I'm if I'm uh, uh, if I'm a, a, a if I'm trying to sell a painting, right? Um, yes, I want a lot of people on my Instagram. I want a lot of people looking at my work and appreciating it, um, but. It's not selling any of my work necessarily just to have people looking at it on Instagram. Um, so what I want, if I'm actually trying to sell my work, is I want a vehicle to get people that are interested into my email list so that I can say, so I can email them directly um, and say, I have this limited edition. Um, so if you like my stuff on my Instagram, I have this, I have this, I, I want to send you this uh, Christmas card that might have my, a picture of my own design uh, on it or a set of them or something like that at a discount. Um, uh, um, for the next couple of days, you can, you can uh, get my custom Christmas cards at, at, um, uh, at, at a discount. That's something you can't do on Instagram. Instagram is specifically designed not to allow you to be able to do that, they don't want you taking customers out of their ecos, uh, uh, out out of their um, their platform. YouTube doesn't either. Uh, Facebook, none of these people want you to be having this long conversation with their customer. They want their they want everybody watching their content. That's how they bring in the advertising money. So um, yes, Instagram is cool. You can do a lot of things on Instagram to meet new people. Uh, one thing that you can do to meet new people on Instagram is follow artists that maybe do similar work, um, see who's leaving comments on their work, and like those people's pages. Um, uh, make comments yourself uh, on those, um, and and uh, just by reaching out to those people that 
like similar pages, then you're you're more likely to start creating, um, getting people that will comment on your page uh, and create traffic uh, on your pages. But traffic on your page is not sales. And we have to keep, um, uh, keep in mind uh, that not to say that traffic isn't good and we don't want, yes, we want brand recognition. We want lots of people to follow us. Um, but we want people to buy our work or we won't be able to afford to continue to make it. That's really what uh, it boils down to. That's what separates, um, you know, a, 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 a business from a hobby. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, if you are serious about what you're doing, um, then you should uh, be equally serious about getting people out of the admirer uh, category and get them into the customer. Uh, category, because those are the people who are going to end up allowing you to continue to do your art. And so I guess the, uh, you know, conversation in the chat is that um, as a customer, uh, it's easier uh, to make purchases and that uh, they do make purchases using IG. So I guess the answer is, you know, it's both formats, but if you could make any generalizations, because most people who do marketing and branding say just what you said, that you want to get people into your uh, email list. And so that's why websites kind of ask for that. But a lot of artists use IG to, to show their works, and a lot of them don't even have websites right? Um, you know, to, to sell. And so as you're making a, the journal comment about uh, getting people into the email list, can you further expound on that, the, the why? Um, yeah, because uh, everybody has an email. You can't have an Instagram. You can't have a Facebook. You can't have uh, any of that other social uh, media without an email. Um, and yes, it might be... Um, like it might not be your preferred way um, to interact with a business, uh, but understand that most purchases that you have involve some aspect of it. Um, and and so don't think about like like I th I think about social media as the tip of the spear, um, but the 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 real. Uh, you know the rest of the the rest of it is coming behind that's coming behind it is usually email communication um uh i see one question can you use ig outside or use links on ig outside of the bio no at least not to my knowledge unless they've changed it um so so the only way you can link to something is in your bio uh on ig which that's is how that's how you buy that's how you purchase that's how you support the people on ig Sure. Um, so, so um, if you have if you have a community, uh, uh, um, once again, I'm I'm not knocking any particular um, uh, platform or way. Um, it is very possible that if you have um, a, a really active uh, kind of following on Instagram and you post a new picture uh, on there and you say, you know, if you want to buy physical copy of it the link is in the bio um it's very possible that you can get sales that way um what i'm saying is that um i wouldn't rely on that as a business model um because there's limits to it um so i wouldn't do that and not also have facebook marketing and not also have a website and not also have um seo search engine optimization things uh, so that if people are actually looking for you or looking for work that's in your genre, that you don't show up. Um, uh, I think that, um, one second, we have uh, all these, during COVID, all these go-tos are not working for our, I would, uh, um, uh, our Denise, if you could kind of expand on that uh, when you're saying all these old go-tos um, what you're uh, uh, referring to. I mean, as far as um, online um, uh, 
work. I would say that this this stuff is actually uh, uh, COVID has made uh, a lot of things more um, workable as an independent artist, not the other way around. I think that if you're not a brick, if you're a brick and mortar business and you have, uh, you know, uh, you know, you have to make that nut for rent every um, uh, every month, then there's a disadvantage there, um, you know, financially. Uh, but I think that as a smaller business. Um, you actually have an advantage that you're not competing with brick and mortar. You have you have people sitting in front of their computer screen all day, um, you know, uh, and so you can uh, be one of those one of those things that pops up in somebody's feed, uh, or you know, on the right side of their screen, uh, just like uh, 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 you know anything else that you look up. Um, let me see here. Yeah. So, right. So somebody's like, yeah, I'm not buying, I'm not buying uh, from an artist through an email. Um, I agree and disagree. There are some people who are going to, it depends on the work and, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I'm not going to buy through email. Um, I Yeah. A painting. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that does not get, um, that does not uh, translate through, through, through email. And so uh, there's definitely a disadvantage uh, they're not being able to see the, the work in person. The one thing that email does do, though, is allow you to have a relationship with someone, uh, create a relationship. And, and so um, even if you're not trying to sell directly online to someone, um, you might still be able to say, hey, look, uh, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm about. Um, and and uh, get them hooked into your brand. And if they're hooked into your brand, then you can sell anything online. Um, um, you know, uh, people, you know, people that are fans of what you're doing will buy it because they like you. Um, and, and, um, you know, I, I, I think about, uh, uh, any, any strong brand, uh, that you, that you see, if they do a good job of establishing a good relationship with you, um, then you're much more likely to to, to go online and and uh, and, and purchase uh, than something that you might want to buy more um, that you do, uh, from somebody that you don't have a relationship with. Um, one second, let's see here. So it's important. So may. If I may uh, jump in here. Yes. Uh, yeah, so my background is actually uh, in communications, marketing, social media. Um, I have a degree in communication studies from American University, and I am also of on the teetering side of where millennials turn to Gen Z uh, in age. So I've grown up with all of this. And one of the things that you know, as you were to bring it back to what you were saying about looking at what, you know, the big successful companies and even some of the smaller successful companies do, they have every single part of this, uh, yeah. which is what you're, uh, you know, what you're saying. And I just want to reiterate that because people are saying, you know, in the chat that they don't like to do this or they love Instagram or whatever. And you limit yourself if you only focus on what you like because there might be other customers who don't have an Instagram or uh, have an Instagram, but don't have a Facebook or have a Facebook, but don't have an Instagram or only have a Twitter. Um, and, you know, there's very interesting social and social aspects around who has what, but when you only do one thing or another, you are limiting your business from reaching those potential um customers, followers, um, you know, and you don't want to do that to yourself. And one of the things, you know, if you're like, you don't like to do this or do that, or it sounds very daunting to start doing all of this, if you haven't done it before, um, is to look up content management systems. Uh, and those are basically, there are quite a few free websites that basically allow you to uh, pre-write, um, 
you know, posts. So like if you have, you know, 4th of July is, 4th of July is coming up or closer to now, Thanksgiving, Halloween, and you don't want to forget to make your Halloween post, you can do that ahead of time and schedule it to post to all of your different places. Um, kind of like, you know, what you do with MailChimp and some of those email marketing systems. Um, and so that's very, very helpful, as well as the other thing people are, uh, you know, we're talking about links in Instagram. Um, you want to absolutely have a Linktree account. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat. Yeah, please do. Um, and they have a free, uh, a free you know, sign up. And basically, if you go on any of the big Instagrams and you click on the link in bio, you know, it usually comes up and you either see a bunch of different pictures and you can click on that and it'll take you to the one thing you're interested in or it'll, you can have, you know, just different buttons. So you, you could have at the very top, you know, sign up for my newsletter when they click, you know, your link tree um, link. And the first thing that'll pop up will be sign up for my newsletter or uh, look, you know, you can add different links to look at my, uh, the article that was written about my work in this magazine um, and stuff like that. And so definitely, definitely, definitely um, check into to all those free things that can make your life easier as you're Sorry, I just wanted to um, say we thank you for all of that. And I just wanted to say I didn't necessarily cut her off to be rude, but just in terms of time and um, managing comments and things of that nature, we have, I wanted to say thank you for everything that you just mentioned, because those were some great tips, um, especially when you brought up the content management. Um, there, as you mentioned, are a lot of them. You have Hootsuite, you have a couple different other ones uh, that are very great tools. Um, some that are specific to IG, some that go across all different platforms. Um, so to her point, I definitely think that um, there are a lot of different tools out here for people to use in terms of navigating this landscape. But before, uh, before I continue, I just want to give the floor back to uh, Samuel, Mr. Prather, um, and before we get before he gets back into his presentation, um, did anybody else have any comments or questions? And I again appreciate and love the conversation and dialogue. Yeah, I, I, all all that. Um, I agree. It's, it's, it's a very large subject. Unfortunately, as a business owner um, or an artist, it's a whole nother kind of level of things that we have to be thinking about. Um, and and if you have somebody that is kind of educated on it, uh, um, as Marcy is, then you might want to holler at her and consult and, and see if you can get some, some help. Um, if that's not something that is kind of more native to you, there's definitely a generational divide. Um, I know that my father, for example, uh, has a cell phone and he only turns it on to make a call. <laughs> so he, he he'll make a call on his cell phone and he'll turn it off and it's like dad that's not the way that it, it works like it's you know you don't unplug the house phone from the wall when you're done calling like it, it's like but i have to charge it all the time and run it it's like yes like like you know it's a it's a that's part of part of it um the 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 thing about it is whether whatever it is that might be working for you um a little bit um don't take that as 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 job you know uh, mission accomplished. Um, take that as okay. Let me let me take a look at what's working on Instagram and see who is responding on Instagram. And if Instagram is something that's just like really hot for me right now because uh, with younger people, you know, it's like well, let me try out TikTok then. Um, you know, because that's where younger people, the people that are the next tier down are or whatever, you know, social media thing comes up next. Um, 
uh, if your if your clientele is is older, um, you know that might not be necessarily the the way to go. But you never know until you do the research. So if you find that you know, uh, like like and uh, like she was saying, don't make your decisions based on what you like. Make decisions on what people are responding to. So if uh, uh, if you find that you know sixty percent of your business is coming from uh, people of a certain age bracket in a certain demographic, um, you'd be crazy uh, not to kind of cater uh, more of your advertising to uh, that group that is, you know, uh, supporting most of your business. Uh, and that also comes to the way, you know, the way that you craft your brand. So if you know that, um, for example, I don't know, 70% uh, uh, of, of, of your clients listen to Backyard Band, then when they go to your website, you don't want the background music in your commercial to be Chopin, right? Um, so you want to just, you know, uh, don't, don't necessarily, you know, you might love Chopin, but if most of your customers um, are, are, are listening to sexy ladies, right? Then you want to kind of take that into account um, that uh, as an artist, Yes, your art is your expression, but as a business, um, you have a responsibility to uh, tailor your advertisement and your marketing towards the people that are actually supporting the business. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we were going to get in. Somebody had mentioned that you have to do kind of a lean canvas, which is kind of a one page business plan. Uh, we were going to get into that uh, and then, you know, what a business plan is, but it's really about research, 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 and knowing who your customer is. Because if you're selling, you know, works of art that the average price is $1,200, that's going to be, you know, a certain customer base uh, that you're targeting. And so uh, the general comment was that you should have all of the tools in the box. Uh, we, as a small business technical assistance agency that works uh, east of the river, most uh, of the artists that we work with uh, only use Instagram uh, and don't uh, have websites uh, and haven't uh, built, you know, websites. And so that limits kind of the tools uh, that they, you know, have in the box. And so kind of what Sam was talking about is different techniques uh, to, you know, funnel down and identify your customer and communicate with them. But really in your research, research is identifying, you know, what, what who is your customer and be able to describe, uh, you know, who that target person is. And a lot of times you find out by talking to customers. And so I generally tell people, you know, to talk to 60 potential customers, not anybody that you know, because a lot of businesses are in, particularly in art, uh, if you don't like my art, you could kiss my so-and-so, uh, as opposed to being customer driven. And so uh, a lot of times you could develop your body of work uh, and, you know, and find your customers, uh, through showing your work to different people, but you have to kind of research and define who they are, or you could be, you know, totally uh, customer driven, but that is not generally the DNA of an artist is to be customer driven. Uh, a lot of times they do what they like to do. But when you're trying to become commercially successful, there at least has to be a balance. Um. Yeah, what I would what I would say um, to uh, piggyback on that just real quick is that um, you want to be like you can still be, you know, expressive uh, as yourself as an artist, but make sure that uh, the customer experience is something that you focus on separately from your artistic expression. And you can always, uh, you can always do what you want, 
but people are still going to buy what they're going to buy based on the customer experience. Um, and the, there's plenty of examples of people um, whose product is terrible, uh, but their customer experience and their and their branding is so on point that they're successful. Um, so you know, don't don't um, uh, don't over uh, um, you know overcorrect on the individuality artistically at the expense of finding out what you know kind of customer experience is actually going to generate sales for you. Okay, and so with that being said, um, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, I want to thank everybody who engaged, um, added their comments, um, gave some extra helpful tents. Um, I want to thank those who were on at the beginning of the call um, and said they just came in support of CAH and weren't necessarily even artists. We thank you very much. Um, again, we will work to get these presentations up on our website over at uh, dcarts.gov. Um, and we will also have this call itself um, able for people to view to go back and pull all of the nuggets and things that were discussed um, throughout the evening. As I open in the chat, again, if you all want to leave any specific topics that you would like to see co covered as it pertains to uh, individual artists, um, up and coming artists, or if you're trying to make that um, leap from small to medium, medium to large, or if you're an arts organization, or if you're an individual artist trying to, you know, become an organization, whatever your story or whatever it is that you uh, would like to hear us speak about, you can leave that in the chat or me as well as my colleague, uh, Patrick has left our emails in the chat. You can take those down. Um, you can reach out to either one of us in terms of any discussions or anything that you would like to see come from Business of the Arts, as this is more about what it is you all need as the arts community, rather than what it is we want you all to kind of accept. And I want to give a huge, huge, huge thank you and shout out to uh, the Congress Heights Community Training and Development Corporation for coming out and supporting us um, on our first time back uh, since COVID uh, for our business of the arts. And I wanna, you know, thank you and appreciate everything that you have done um, in helping us make this evening happen. Um, and this won't be the last that you see of them um, as we will, again, keep them in contact with everything that we have going on. And again, beautiful people, thank you. I know everybody has uh, super, super, super important things to do as COVID has made things digital, but not less. There's still a lot of work to be done. I know people are doing work, people are uh, taking care of home, so I'm not gonna hold everybody up. And with that being said, thank you to every single person and good evening.